Hello, I'm Hugh Ross, and I'm here with our visiting scholar at Reasons to Believe, uh, Leslie Wickman. And uh, Leslie, uh, you're going to talk to us a little bit about uh, climate change. I don't know about you, but on my social media, I got people all over the fence on that. Oh, Most, yeah. Some of them claiming it's not real, some of them saying it's real. Yeah. I see them debating one another, they get angry with one another. Right. Can you show, shed some light on this? Yeah, well, I think my experience is pretty similar. People um, are skeptical about climate change. and But they you, don't get angry with you. They're getting angry with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've seen some anger. People get heated about it. I think it's an emotional issue for a lot of right. people. And, um, you know, when I first started researching uh, the uh, climate change impacts on national security uh, with the aerospace industry, um, I, one of the first things I wanted to do is look at the evidence to see for myself, you mm -hmm. know, what does the evidence show? And I know we've talked about this a bit before, but um, one of the most convincing things for me was to look at the ice core data that goes back hundreds of thousands of years. And, you know, these, the, these ice core samples obviously are taken from uh, uh, permanent glaciers around the globe, and we see this very regular pattern for the last 800,000 years or so, where we have 90,000 years worth of severe ice, followed by temperate climate for about 10,000 years on average, followed by another 90,000 years worth of... So what you're saying is that these deep ice cores are showing evidence that we're living in an ice age cycle. Exactly. Where the ice cycles from about exactly. 10 to 23 percent coverage. Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, what, what ice cores are we talking about here? Well, in permanent glaciers, so mm -hmm. places like um, Greenland, um, Antarctica, um, persistent glaciers that have been around for these long, long periods of time. And the ones that I've seen the longest have gone about 800,000 years or so. And we're talking about glaciers where we've got reliable annual layers. Where exactly. There's not melting going on in the wintertime. Yes, Cold exactly. Where, That's exactly yeah. right. So, yeah, you can discern the, the winter and, and summer from those melting uh, cycles during the summer, but uh, it's like essentially like counting rings in a tree. Right. Right. So you can see these these annual cycles. And it's not just Greenland. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's again, it's persistent glaciers around the globe that show this. Yeah. Is it, whether it Greenland, Antarctica, the Alps, yes, and the Himalayas. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. And and so for me, it was like, wow, you can look at this, and and I think. The impetus for me looking at that was many of these conversations where people would just say, oh, what we're experiencing now is just part of the, the natural cycles that the Earth goes through. And so I thought, you know, I want to look at what those natural cycles right, are. Right. And so in looking at these ice core, these deep ice core samples, you see this as we've been talking about, this very regular pattern of 90,000 years worth of severe ice followed by 10,000 years on average of temperate climate. Right. And so if we look through that, that data, we see that now we're 12,000 some years into this temperate cycle. And if we're just relying on the natural cycles, we should be cooling. Yes. Well, in fact, the natural cycles have been cooling the planet for the last 8,000 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time the Earth's rotation axis tilt uh, goes down towards uh, 24, mm -hmm. that warms the planet. When it goes back up to 22, that cools the planet. Right. And it's going that way. Yeah. And the shape of Earth's orbit, uh, when right. it's more elliptical, that warms the planet. When it's less elliptical, that cools the yes. planet. Yes. And right now, we should be seeing fairly severe cooling because exactly. both of those natural cycles are working together exactly. to cool the planet. Exactly. And that's another thing that I looked at was these Milankovitch cycles. Right. And, you know, the variations in the eccentricity of Earth's orbit. So what's warming the planet? If the natural cycles are cooling it. Well, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, we've... You've got some really interesting data, I think, that um, our audience can probably get a look at. And, um, you know, it shows how we're, what we're experiencing now is outside of those normal natural cycles, right? 
Yeah, well, the, the one slide we can see, the first slide here, basically shows you the last ice age. Mm -hmm. And you can see that uh, when you're in an ice age, the climate is very unstable. Mm -hmm. But you said if we look at all the ice age stuff, I mean, we've been an ice age cycle for 2.6 million years. Yeah. And part of it was a 41,000 year periodicity. We're now in 100,000 years. Mm -hmm. But throughout that entire period, the climate has been extremely unstable. Yeah. Temperatures jumping up and down by 10 degrees centigrade over yeah. time scales of just a few centuries. Yeah. The exception has been the last 9,000 years. Exactly. Where it's been extremely uh, stable. Yeah. And uh, the rationale there is we have these cooling that should be driving us to an ice age. Right. But human activity exactly. is warming the planet. Exactly. And the two have been in balance. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's, yeah. So for a period of, in fact, this next slide here is basically showing you what the last 9,500 years looked like. Yeah. And you can see that the cooling has slightly superseded the human activity mm -hmm. of warming. Mm -hmm. So over the last 9,000 years, the temperature has dropped by one degree centigrade. Right. That's from 9,500 years ago until 1950. Mm -hmm. It had that very gradual drop. Right. But during that period, the climate was stable yeah. to plus or minus 0. 0.65 degrees. Yeah. But I think the one, the one piece of data that I found really does persuade uh, the global warming skeptics got published just a few months ago where they took temperature records uh, off the ocean. Mm -hmm. In other words, because a lot of the complaint was, hey, when you're looking at Greenland, uh, those sites are 8,000 feet above sea level. Right. And we all know the higher up you go, the colder right. it gets. The higher up you go, the more unstable the climate. Right. So they said, we're only going to do sea level measurements, yeah. and we're going to take them in the ocean, just off the continental uh, land masses. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're going to get the most reliable record of what's happening globally. Right. And this is what the graph looks like. Yeah. And basically shows you that from 900 A.D., to 1950 AD, right. the climate was miraculously stable. Right, exactly. Plus or minus 0 0.06 degrees variation. Yeah. And, you know, it's not an accident that that was that period of time when civilization was exponentially expanding. Exactly. Humans yes. now had the climate stability where they could count on the crops actually producing. Right. And so that's when we had a huge food surplus. Yes, and, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but this also shows that when you go from 1950 to 2022, right. there really is no doubt that the global mean exactly. temperature has been going up. It's only risen by one degree, yeah. uh, but that's a factor of 15 times the uh, uh, variation of the past thousand years. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, so it's pretty hard to ignore the impact that right. at least there's a correlation between uh, human a industrial activity and yeah, you might this. debate what kinds of activities are having right. the biggest impact on warming the planet. Uh, but we've seen this one degree rise at a time when the natural cycles have been cooling the planet. Right. And of course, there's more of us now, and uh, exactly. technology really has exploded exactly. since the end of World War II. Absolutely. So, but yeah. trying to point the finger, this is number one, this is number two. Right. That's going to be hard to do. Yeah, yeah. But there is a definite correlation with human activity. and. It's very hard to ignore when you actually look at um, these patterns. Yeah, well, I've, again, I'm finding that this latest set of measurements really is convincing the skeptics. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, it's such a reliable set of measurements. It's worldwide, it's not just in one place. Yeah. And it's interesting, though, to me, um, just from kind of a uh, psychology standpoint or worldview standpoint, what do you think is um, the skeptics' biggest resistance to acknowledging climate change? I think change? it's the politics. It's not the data. Okay, yeah. It's the politics yeah. basically saying the governments of the world and other major corporations are using this to try to force the peoples of the world to do what they don't want to do. Okay, interesting. And so it's like, yeah, they, they see this as oppressive. Yeah, yeah, and I, I can't help but think too in in the cultural time that we're in, where people are so polarized in their political positions, that this is just one more thing that they equate to um, political positions. Yeah, they're claiming that the politicians are fudging the data in order to achieve their agenda 
and they don't like their political agenda, right. so they question the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, you know, we do live in a polarizing uh, society. Yeah. After all, uh, the people who make money on social media realize they can sell more product if they polarize the population. Yeah, sad but true. <laughs> sad but true. <laughs> I mean, I'm even having to deal with people who believe that the world is flat. Oh, oh my gosh. So <laughs> I've had that, too. I've had people reach out to and me. And, hey, in your area, have you ever run into these people who claim we didn't go to the moon? Oh, yes. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> I have to keep showing them, hey, here's actual photographic proof I know. that there's stuff still on the moon right, that was exactly. left behind by the Apollo people. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, I honestly, I have had people kind of, try to bait me by email and say, oh, I really enjoyed your talk on thus and so. But do you really believe those NASA photos that show the curvature of the Earth? <laughs> and when I come back and innocently say, well, yes, <laughs> then they say, oh, no, those those photos are fake. They're, you know, doctored and um, they're not real. And, and then I'm just like, then they'll go on to say the Earth is flat. And I'm like, I honestly don't even know where to start this conversation. Well, what I tell them is book a flight from New York to Santiago, Chile, make it a night flight, get a window seat, look out the window, and see what happens to the constellations. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's I've actually done that. Really yeah, it's good. really yeah, a the neat lab, experience. You yeah, get to latitude. see them slowly turn upside yeah, down. And yeah. Then, yeah, that's actually a really good uh, suggestion. I like that. Although, one of the best ones I've heard is. The best proof that the world is not flat, if it was flat, cats would have knocked everything off the edge. <laughs> As a cat lover, I can relate to yeah, that. You can relate to that. <laughs> anything will be bad off. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good one, too. But, yeah, it, it is interesting the kinds of um, objections that you hear and, and questions that you get. But I, there seems to be this kind of widespread uh, mistrust of science and technology. So, and data. Uh, Leslie, what can we do to help alleviate that problem? How can we scientists uh, better communicate to the public? Yeah, uh, well, what's worked for me well in, in cl the classroom, I, I mean, I have taught a lot of classes that are kind of gen ed science to non-science majors. Mm -hmm. And so students come in, um, typically having already chosen not to pursue science as a career. And, you know, that kind of tells you a little bit about the demographic. I'm teaching at Christian universities, and sometimes the reasons that students have decided not to pursue science is because this widespread perception that science and faith are incompatible. And so I have the opportunity, though, to talk to them about science. and. Um, a lot of it, to me, is about building relationship with the students where they come to a point where they trust me, mm -hmm. right? And so they're more apt to believe what I say if they trust me in advance. And so part of it, again, is relationship. Uh, the second thing that uh, I suggest is coming from a very humble perspective and just say, hey, let's just talk about this. You know, I'm not trying to... Um, tell you that I have all the answers, but let's just talk about this. You know, let's, let's use this as kind of a problem-solving exercise. What do we know that relates to this topic? Let's put all the stuff that we know on the table and then discuss the evidence and see where the evidence leads. So doing it in a very non-threatening way to where it's like, let's just have a conversation about that. And sometimes I'll get to a point where I'll say, uh, well, what if? What if the data led us this way? What would that mean to you? Uh, and so kind of approaching it in a really um, non-threatening way, again, has been really, really uh, effective for me. Sure, and helping them to evaluate science. I mean, you and I know that scientists love to debate and disagree. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and if there's no disagreement or debate going on, chances are that's really secure science. Right, exactly. Because they'll take every opportunity they've got to question something. Yes, so. exactly. And as I often tell my students, um, I describe science as uh, looking for the best explanation given the body of evidence that we currently have. And, and so I try to get them to look at the evidence for themselves and come to their own conclusions. Yeah, get involved. Exactly. And Re isn't that a biblical mandate? Exactly. I mean, Test to study everything. both of yes. God's books. 
Yeah, absolutely. I keep telling my students, don't leave it up to us professionals. Exactly. God wants everybody to be a scientist. God wants everybody to be a theologian. Yes, And exactly. it's too much fun. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know, have some fun with it. Exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, you're missing out. You really are. Yeah. Okay. Well, Leslie, this has really been great. And for all of you that are watching here, uh, go to reasons.org, uh, search under Leslie Wickman, and all the material, videos, and things that she's been doing for us will pop up for you.